we are doing a study called uh, A Faith That Works from the little book of James. Now, James was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't believe in Jesus after he saw his brother Jesus, who was the Son of God, raised from the dead. Prior to that, he was, a, he was an unbeliever. But seeing his brother who had died living again made a believer out of him. And uh, he acknowledged that he was the Son of God. It's very interesting that the little book that he writes sounds a whole lot like his brother Jesus. Uh, it, uh, it models itself a lot after the Sermon on the Mount. And today we want to focus in on a, a theme that we, we really need a dynamic faith that really works when we're tempted to play God. You say, who, me? Tempted to play God? You got to be kidding. Yes, we do this. We, we attempt to play God in two ways. We attempt to play God with other people in their lives, and we attempt to play God with ourselves. Uh, we kind of elevate ourselves up even above God. Uh, how do we do this with others? That's what I want to explore first. We attempt to play God with other people. Our passage today begins in chapter 4, verse 11, with brothers do not slander one another. One of the ways that we attempt to play God with other people is we just slander them. Now, it's very interesting that he goes on and says, anyone who speaks against his brother. Now, he's talking about the family, Christians. When you speak against another Christian, all right, and the text here literally the Greek word is when you speak down, <clears throat> that you are superior in your speech, you speak down to them. <clears throat> Sometimes we, when I was younger, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we called that putting somebody down, putting somebody down. It means speak down. Slander is an utterance of defamatory statements that's injurious to the reputation or well-being of a person. It's a malicious statement or a report, according to Webster. So, uh, when I speak against somebody who's in the family of God with ill intent, I'm slandering according to the Bible, according to this passage. Or, he says, slander is like passing judgment. You speak against your brother or you judge him. You judge that person. Now, why is he saying that this is slanderous? Well, when you speak against the law, when you're, when you're judging the other person, you're speaking against the law and you're judging God's law. Here's what I mean. The law says this in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. It says this, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see, what I'm doing when I'm judging my neighbor when I'm judging a fellow Christian, I am not loving that fellow Christian. I, I am in judgment on them. When, I, when I'm some ill intent, I'm saying something mean or nasty, when I do that, I am not keeping the law because I'm supposed to love that person no matter what, no matter what. Furthermore, it's upon this very verse in Leviticus that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, taught us Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, when, I, when I'm harboring some animosity, some bitterness, some, and I say something evil, I lash out against another Christian, I am not loving my neighbor. I'm judging my neighbor. I'm passing judgment on him. Furthermore, the text goes on and says this. When you judge the law... You are not keeping it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it. I should be a keeper of the law, not a judge of the law. In fact, but I am sitting in judgment on it. This is the way it really should be. God, who's given us his law, let's choose the Ten Commandments. God has given us the Ten Commandments. I'm supposed to have no other God but God. I'm not supposed to use his name in vain. I'm supposed to, you know, keep the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And it goes down the whole list. There's a list of these. I'm not to kill. I am not to steal. I am not, and why is that? I'm not to covet. He's got all this. That's what God says. 
That's in his law. And so I am supposed to be under the law, keeping the law of God and doing it. But instead of being under God's law, what I find is when I do my own thing, I swap places with God. I am sitting over God's law and saying, oh God, you must not have meant that for me. You must have meant that for everybody else, not for me. You see, I had a lady one day come into my office years and years ago. And she said to me, it's God's will for me to get a divorce. I said, what? She says, it's God's will for me to get a divorce. You see, God said, he's a God of love. And I'm to love everybody. Well, God put love in my heart for a different man. <laughs> and so God, and, and, and I have such love for this other man. God, my, God wants me to divorce my husband so I can love this other man. I said, what? Are you crazy? Wait, you know what she's done? She's placed her will over God's law, and, and she's sitting on judgment on God's law, and she's only taking and picking and choosing what she wants. Yes, the Lord does say, love everyone. Love your neighbor as yourself. But he also says, I am holy, I am just. He also says in Malachi, I hate divorce. And so he says, you know, the, the people in, in Jesus' day came to him and said, then why did, why did Moses grant divorce? He said, he didn't, he didn't command divorce. Uh, he only granted it because of the hardness of your heart. Hardness of your heart. I want to tell you the truth. This is a truth. Truth statement. In every divorce, either one or both, have a hard heart. Have a hard heart. Jesus said it was not so from the beginning, for he brought two together, and they were to be mates for life. What God has joined together, let nobody tear apart. Let nobody tear apart. But because a hardness of heart enters in, because we're all sinners, he allowed you to divorce. It was not God's will for that lady, and I don't think it's God's will for anyone to say, hey, I'm, I'm reneging on my, my commitment when I made a marriage that uh, I will be faithful to you as long as I shall live. It, it is not God's will for that. But you can't control anyone else's heart. You can only control your own heart, whether there's hardness in your heart. In your heart. You see, what happens is, instead of putting ourselves under the authority of God and what God says, we put ourselves above God and we say, I don't like what God said, so I like what I say better. I like what I say better. And so I choose my view, and I impose it. It comes to be like this often. A person says, well, um, my God would never do that. And then I say, well, wait a minute. What's the God of the Bible do? Because if you're, not, if you're putting yourself above the God of the Bible and say he wouldn't do that, then maybe if the word of God says contrary, you're sitting in judgment on God and you're not under his authority. He's saying, stop slandering other people because the word of God says they're your neighbor. Do everything to build them up, not tear them down. That's what the word of God says. You know, the most quoted verse in the Bible today, I always thought it was John 3, 16, but I heard a, a famous apologist not too long ago say, it has changed. The most quoted verse today among the Generation X and Millennials is not for God so loved the world, but judge not lest ye be judged. Judge not that you not be judged. The whole idea is you never judge. And there's some truth in that, that, that we're not to be judge, judgmental. But I want to talk about judgment for a minute. There is a different kind, there are different kinds of judgment. There's different kinds. The word judgment comes from the little Greek word, and this is a catch-all word. It's the word krino. I got it right there in the Greek New Testament word. The New Testament was originally written in the Greek language. The word krino simply means I separate. And so I want to do a little separation. You see what I had there was the grayscale. That's the way the world sees everything. Everything's grayscale. There's no absolutes. But the person who judges distinguishes between, they, they, they remove all the gray and put all the, all the dark with the dark side and all the light on the light side, and they distinguish between what we would call good and bad. That's, that's what it is to judge. I separate between what is good and what is bad. I also separate between what is right and what is wrong. I separate. 
And so this word means, krino, I separate, actually is the word translated to judge. Judgment is any time you separate between things. Now, watch this. When they add the little word ana, which is a preposition to the word krino, it means over judge, they use that for investigate. An investigator is looking over things and he's making judgments about the things he's finding. He's doing an investigation. It's like he's got a magnifying glass and he's looking for every detail so that he can come to some conclusion by separating what is right and what is wrong, what is true, what is, what is a fact, what is not. And he's doing an investigation. Another concept here is you put the little preposition apo in front of the word crino and you get the word from judge from judge, which means I answer in the Greek New Testament. I answer. You see, somebody asks me a question, and I say, "Uh, it's a beautiful day, don't you think? Well, I stop and I pause. I look at, it is, I'm making a judgment. Yeah, the sun's shining, it's a beautiful, gorgeous day. And I I, I now, I, I, from my judgment, I give an answer. And so, in the Bible, every time you give an answer, you've made a judgment. You can't live without judging. You've got to judge to say yes or no. Another word is diacrino. Diacrino. This is a word through plus judgment. You see, there's all that gray scale out there in the world, and uh, I have got to see through all of that and, and separate it all out. We call this discernment. Discernment. I have to discern. I, I do this with my children when they were growing up. I noticed that without adult supervision, I just don't want you hanging around with those certain characters. Why? I was using discernment. I assessed what they were doing in their life. I don't want my child doing that in their life. And it says in 1 Corinthians, bad company corrupts good morals. Why would I put my child into bad company that's going to corrupt his good morals without adult supervision there to make sure it doesn't happen? I have to see through all the gray and make a decision. Hey, this is politics today. We've got to, this, this Tuesday when we cast our vote, we've got to look through all the gray out there. We've got to sort it out, separate it, and we've got to be discerning in our vote. God expects us to make that kind of judgment. We've got to judge. Then there's this one, procrino. It means before judge. That's where you fast forward to the end. And you make a judgment about everything you didn't know about. You jump to a conclusion. We call that prejudice. You prejudge prejudice. You judge without even knowing. Bad judgment there. Bad judgment. There's soon crino. <laughs> soon crino means with judgment. With judgment. It means I compare. And I want to compare apples with apples, not apples with oranges. And I make a comparison. What is the most important here? Uh, I need to do that. This is, this is a good thing. Now, katakrino means down, judge. And that means I condemn. I am judging you down. I am pointing my finger at you and condemning you. I I might be thinking that I'm giving you criticism, negative criticism, or I am critiquing you, but what I am doing is trying to put you in your place. I am katakrino, I'm condemning you. Here's one, autokrino. In fact, the Bible tells us to do that at the Lord's Supper table. The auto credo, we got auto yourself, credo, so it's self-judgment. We call that, I examine myself. It tells us when we come to the Lord's Supper table, it's not my job to examine you, it's your job to examine yourself. It's not your job to examine me, it's my job to examine myself. I make judgment about myself. God has given me a conscience. My conscience is that part of me, okay, It's that part of me that passes judgment on what I do or think. It works in two ways. When I do something that I think is good, it says, hey, good job. (laughs) When I do something that that is wrong and and I I think that, ooh, two two different things pops up, I either say, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. All right? Okay, that's my conscience. I'm passing judgment now, not just on myself, I'm passing on somebody else. Or I just say, hey, the standard was too high. Something like that. We all do this. We have to do self-examination. The Bible commands us to judge myself when I come to the Lord's Supper table. Here's the point that I'm trying to make. 
God expects us to judge, to investigate, to answer, to discern, to compare, have self-examination, and a lot of things. In fact, it says the spiritual man makes judgments about all things. But he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. You're going to stand before God. So you're not subject to other people's judgment. You're going to stand before God. And I'm expected to use discernment, self-examination. I'm supposed to answer correctly. I'm supposed to compare. I'm supposed to make judgment in my life. But God prohibits condemning. I am not to act as somebody else's God and condemn them for what they are doing. I am not to be a person of condemnation. By usurping his role and acting as if I were God in someone else's life and telling them that they are whatever, wrong, evil, going to hell, whatever, I, to tell them that, that you're irredeemable or whatever, all these different terms that are used today, deplorable, all these terms. I'm not to do that. God prohibits that. That's what Jesus meant when he said, judge not lest you be judged. Why? He says, slander is passing judgment. There is only one lawgiver and you're not the lawgiver. That was Deuteronomy chapter six. God gives the law. We're accountable to God. God is not accountable to us. He is the one who is able to save and to destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Saying you're not God. You're not God. We play God with others, but we also play God with ourselves. We play God with ourselves. When we think that we are in control, we're playing God. It's, it's just the wrong attitude that I'm in control. But, but we all send, tend to get that. He says this in verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into the city or that city and we'll spend a year there. Like I'm a master of my own time. I'm in control of my own time. No, you're not. God appointed the time that you would be born. You didn't choose that. God has already appointed the time of your departure. You didn't choose that either. God is the master of time. You can say, I'm going to spend a year here. Oh, maybe, maybe not. I don't think so. Could be, maybe not. He says, problem is we think that we're the master of my world. Uh, that we will go to this or that city, that I'm in control of this world. I can do whatever I want here on this planet. And I'll spend a year there in that place. That I, I'm a master of my universe. No, you're really not. Or, or I'm the master of my success. I'm going to carry on business. Or I'm going to make money. That I, I, I'm going to do this. You play God when you think that you are the master of it all and not dependent upon him. It's futile to play God. And that's what he goes on next. He says, our ignorance is futile. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. If I knew what was going to happen tomorrow, I would play the stocks today. <laughs> but you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And listen, he says, what is your life, your whole life? You are a mist, whoops, there we go. You are a mist, I think I clicked one too many times. <laughs> you, you are a mist. We're going to get into that season, we're going to see the mist like every morning. It's going to be so cold outside when you're in a traffic, you're going to see the little mist coming out of the exhaust pipes. You know that, that? That same exhaust always comes out, but you only see it when the weather's really cold. Certain, it's there and it's gone. Boom, it's gone. Bruce Wilkinson in his book, A Life That God Rewards, he calls it a dot. Your life's the dot. Boing. <laughs> it's just a little dot. You notice the dot on, on, on the, the far left-hand side is the beginning of the dot, and it's real tiny and small, and then it gets wider and bigger. That's kind of the way life is. It starts small. We just had a grandson this week. He's just a tiny little thing. He doesn't do anything, but he, he sleeps, he eats, and he gets rid of what he ate. All right? And that's his whole life. I mean, that's all he does. That's all he does. But, but then it gets bigger and bigger in the middle, right? 
and life is full, and then you hit your midlife, and you have a crisis of some sort, and then things started to decline, and then you get down to the very end, it's just a little tiny end of the dot, and the people who are getting towards the end of the dot all say, it's all gone by too quickly. Your life is nothing but a dot. In contrast, there's the line. The dot and the line. The line represents eternity. And it goes on and on and on and on. In his book, he brings out all the scripture references that make the point that it's what you believe in the dot that determines where you spend the line. If you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you spend the entire line, eternity, above the line in the place called heaven with Jesus forever and ever. So the dot is so important because it's here that we formulate what we believe. And if I believe in Jesus as my Savior for all eternity, I will live above the line with God forever. Now, if I don't believe in Jesus as my Savior, I reject it and say, no, you know, I'm good. I'll be my own God. Thank you, Jesus, but I'll be my own God. And you end the dot. You step into eternity. You go below the line. What the Bible says is a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. You just join those evil spirit beings that have rejected God because you've rejected his son. You spend eternity below the line. What you believe in this life matters. It matters. Where are you going to spend eternity? Now, what you believe in the dot is so important, but what you do in the dot is also important. Because what you do in the dot is going to determine how you're going to spend the line. Above it in heaven? With great reward or loss of reward? We have an expression for that. We call it by the skin of your teeth. I got in by the skin of my teeth. I believed in Jesus but never did anything for him. The Bible says uh, you're saved as though by fire in 1 Corinthians 3. You got into heaven but everything you did was burned up. There was no reward, no crown. You didn't live your life for Jesus. Now, now the person who has rejected Jesus, and I know some are are very pious and nice and wonderful neighbors, and uh, some of them are very evil people who have rejected Jesus, including the Hitlers of the world. All right? It also determines what they do, determines where they will spend the line and how they will spend it. They reject Jesus below the line because they're so evil There's degrees of punishment that is going to be given for all eternity. James is saying here, what is your life? You're not the master of your faith. Don't be ignorant about this. Life is important because it's what you believe and what you do in your life determines how you spend all eternity. All eternity. Our presumption is futile to say, oh, tomorrow, next week, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live or do this or that. I'm not the master of my fate. The Lord is the master. He will determine whether I will live or what I will do. As it is, your boast and your, you, you boast and you brag, and all such boasting is evil. It's evil. Anyone then who knows the good, I just mentioned it, believe in Jesus and the dot, live for him. You know to do the good, and he doesn't do it, it is sin. And the wages of sin is death, and the death was cast in the lake of fire. Listen, don't omit omission. This is called a sin of omission. It's when I know to do what is right, and I don't do it. I'm driving down the road and I see somebody stranded along the side and I say, Puh, dummy should have carried a cell phone. He could have called for help. Well, was I allowed to help? No. I knew that I should have stopped, but I'm suppressing that I'm omitting doing what I should do. 
Or I know I should just dial 911 on my phone and say, hey, at mile marker, such and such, there's a car pulled over on the side, but I don't do that. To him who knows to do good and does it not, doesn't do it. Sin. Sin. You say, yeah, but there could be a risk there. It could be a ploy where they're just waiting to get me. You can't trust God to protect you when you're trying to do good. To him who knows what he ought to do and he doesn't do it, it's sin. I want to wrap up with the story that Jesus told. I just want to read his story. Jesus told told this story. He said, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop and he thought to himself, what shall I do. See the focus? Got a great crop. What shall I do? (laughs) I have no place to store my crops. Then he said to himself, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build greater, bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of goods and things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. This man was the master of everything. He thought he was the master of all of his possessions. He thought he was the master of his time. He thought he was the master of his place. He thought he was the master of his future. He he, He was playing God. I'm in control of everything. I'm on top of it all. God said, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Then Jesus adds this commentary on the story. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Who in the dot live for themselves, live for themselves, just live for themselves, rejected the Lord as sovereign, the one who's over all, the master of everything, and his son, Jesus Christ. That's the way it is below the line. But for the one who receives Christ, lives for him, above the line, with great reward for all eternity, for all eternity. I want you to take two things away today. Number one, don't play God with others. Instead, allow God to be the God of other people. Allow God to to work in their lives. You don't have to jump in and fix their lives. If you've you've got that urge, just pray to God, God, change the person, let, let God do the work, okay? The second one is don't play God with yourself. You need to enthrone God as God in your own life. Don't play God. You know what? It takes an incredible faith that works to do these two things. It takes a genuine biblical faith that works. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we want that kind of faith. There could be someone here who's never in this life of the dot placed their faith in Jesus and said, Lord, I want you to be my Savior, my Lord, and my God so that I can spend all eternity above the line living with you forever. Lord, we know if they'll just pray and say, Lord, I want you as my Savior, you'll save them. You'll change their life. They'll be on a whole new path and a whole new direction. And they can live for you and receive great reward. Uh, Some of us, Lord, at times we wander away like the church is in the the book of Revelation. We wander from our first love and we need to come back. We need to acknowledge that I am not God. Lord, I, I need to quit playing that way. Quit judging other people and Lord, just examine my own heart before you. And then, Lord, live for you. Because what I do in this dot does matter. It matters for all eternity. Help me, Lord, to be a better Christian. I pray in Jesus' name.
Amen.